What's up, man? Hey, what's up, boss? How are you? <laughs> Let me adjust my desk here. You know, I think in all the times that I have done a split screen Instagram interview, this might be the fastest we've ever actually connected. I think you just said a, a, a PB. Oh, yes. Then I'm winning. I've already <laughs> won today. You have already won. So, so you know, well, I'm, I'm already distracted. I already figured, uh, thought of something I wanted to ask you. So for any, anyone who doesn't know who I'm talking to, this is Carl Stedman, um, longtime member of the CrossFit training team, seminar staff, flow master. I mean, you know your credentials better than I do. You know, go, go ahead and uh, let the folks know who you are and, and, and where the heck you are in the world with that beard. Uh, uh, I have no idea where I am most of the time, to be honest, buddy. But right now, um, I'm in Scotland, northeast of Scotland, living the dream near a place called the Cairngorms, which is actually the largest national park in the UK. So it's a beautiful area of the world. Um, my credentials, I guess. I am a level four coach. I've been doing CrossFit since 2003. I'm just about to thrash my dog for playing with a very noisy bone in the background. Two seconds. All good. 2003. I don't think I yeah. knew that. Oh, I'm back. There we go. And yeah, I mean, badly. Don't get me wrong, because there was nowhere to learn, right? So I was just doing it poorly off of what I thought was the interpretation of a kettlebell swing by, um, you know, you know, rounded back, kissing my kneecaps and slinging that sucker overhead, you know, learning the hard way. Dude, out of total coincidence, it wasn't for this interview. It's funny you say that because I just happened to get lost yesterday on my phone. You know, obviously I do a lot of stuff on my phone and post workouts and media. And so every now and then I have to go through and just clear out all the junk in there. And I somehow went into my videos and like went all the way back. And I found some videos of me working out in my garage 15, 16 years ago doing quote unquote CrossFit, what I thought was CrossFit <laughs> anyway, with, with no instruction, with no idea what I was doing, it, it, that footage can never make the internet. It was disgusting, revolting. I don't know how I, I mean, so yes, we all, we all went through a learning curve, oh, right? I think, I think mine's out there for all to see as well. There was like, there was the CrossFit UK thing going on, like unofficial official back in the day. And it was a, a video of us just working out in my back garden, right? A few of us doing it. And I think somebody had very eloquently put something like, we, um, yeah, we really respect the enthusiasm of, uh, <laughs> the enthusiasm. Yeah, exactly. Ignore how they're moving. But other than that, you know, like it, the enthusiasm's there. We're very happy. I'm like, uh oh. Anyway, learned that one. Learned the hard way and managed to survive, right? The war of attrition that was CrossFit back in the day. So give people an idea. Most people probably have heard of the level one seminar. Um, the level two, which is phenomenal, and I think probably one of the most underutilized courses that, that CrossFit offers. But, you know, you said you're, you're a level four. There's obviously a level three and a level four. What did those yeah. two look like? So the, the level three and the level four came about, I think, um, because of the high failure rate of the old level two, you know, like the whole turn up, get tested, and it had like a 80-something plus percentage <laughs> failure rate, you know, <laughs> right. Because more often than not, folk were like, oh, I'll do my level one. And what's the next stage? Oh, level two, I'll go and do that next weekend. There's like no practical experience. And so as a result, that was, that was a kind of a tough learning curve for folks. So they kind of spread that out. So the, the level two in terms of turn up and get assist, assessed as what you're doing, then that got now the level four. So they bridged the gap in between. So the level two then got turned into a developmental course, right, where really diving into all the facets that surround effective training. Um, you get introduced to it and developed, fed back on, all that good stuff. And the level three is just basically an old school exam, like four hours, sit in front of a computer and get tested on all shapes and sizes of everything in the CrossFit world, right? You know, running a box to implement mm -hmm. a kid's program to health and safety, to be able to see and correct to, you know, even doing the, you know, the power equation and stuff on certain things. It's like, if so-and-so does Karen in this time, and so-and-so does it in this time, who actually gives you the most power output and stuff? And you're like, oh, so yeah, you have to, you really dive into the methodology. It's pretty cool. All right, I'll get a question asked every now and then of potentially somebody who is, has the desire to go get their level three. And the most common question is how, how in the heck do you recommend I study for this beast? I'm sure yeah. you 
get that question when you work seminars frequently. What's what's your expert answer is how to study for the level three and how to prepare? <laughs> Certifications.crossfit.com, my friend. All the information's <laughs> on there, man. You know, like honestly, other than time and trading on the dance floor, all of the relevant um, articles and reading materials actually posted online. So um, I think the biggest trap, though, that people fall into is once they recognize that there's that laundry list of journal articles and things to dive into, those are just themes that you should have in your area. It's not just, they're not going to say, hey, there's not going to be a question on what did so-and-so say on page two of their particular um, right. you know, information piece. It's just like, hey, <clears throat> this, is, this is a theme that you should have, you know, like you should understand how to train masters and as, as an example or whatever it may be. So I think that's, that's pretty cool. And other than that, it's, um, you know, not getting too wrapped around absolute finer details, you know, be aware of them, but what's the overarching concept. So, you know, mm -hmm. you know, you know, cleaning your barbells. Yes. You know, like that's probably the overarching theme, you know, like what you choose to do. Yeah. You probably want to use some things more than others, right. Probably want to use, um, you know, bleach rather than a wet wipe but it's mm -hmm. you know that's just one small piece but it's just be aware of that stuff and then once you've squared all of that away then what i really like about our credential levels and i'm biased right but obviously sure but I, li I like the fact that you know old other styles of education is like once you've sat that written test and they're like you're good you know you know everything go out and you know you are at the top of your game you know everything Whereas I think we all recognize that, no, that's just a stepping stone. And actually, now you need to go and see if you can actually practically apply it, because that's where the gap is a lot of the time with us as trainers, right? That how do we take all of that knowledge and all of that stuff oh, yeah. running around in our heads and actually, you know, help the person in front of us. And so, um, yeah, that's what I like about the L4. It's like, all right, cool. You've shown you've got all the knowledge. Now let's see if you can do it. And so the L4 is an actual in-person not a textbook, human being working on human being while being evaluated by experts in the field. Imagine. Oh, yep. Which, which, I mean, if we're being honest, that, that level of scrutiny, there's just no way it's not going to make you better, right? I mean, having experts' eyes really on you and letting you know where you're excelling, don't excel, but it has to be the other part of it is it has to be a profoundly stressful and unnerving experience that if you're, if you're just the sort of human being that is humble enough or whatever the proper word is to sign up for it, you're in a unique class of people that you actually said, you know what? Yeah, I'll throw my hat in the ring. Um, let's go do this. Yeah, it's, it's a, I mean, it, it is and it isn't, right? Because it's like, um, I think everybody thrives under that. And it's, it's tough though, right? Because I still remember, I mean, you probably won't even remember this. But I remember like being on the verge of tears after getting probably about three sheets of email worth feedback from you after a seminar. And I'm like scrolling down this thing. And basically all I could see through like the, my misty eyes of like feeling that I sucked was like, yeah, you suck, you know? So I remember even sending you an email being like, do I need to hand my shirt back in? Because based on this, like, I'm not doing too well. And you're like, no, bro, you're doing great. It's just feedback. I'm like, ah. so, you know, I think if you're not used to that level of feedback, it can, it can be tough, but, oh. it's in, but it's entirely developmental. That's the cool thing. You know, like when you sit there and you're like, right, I'm going to look at this and <clears throat> see this as a reason to get better. That's what it's enabled me to do. Every time I worked because I was surrounded by people that I was like, I have to be on my A game. Mm -hmm. I have to be there. There's no, there's, there's no chance that I can have an off game because I'm surrounded by people who I will, I will, you know, I can't let down. They're my teammates and the people that are on the course. And so, yeah, you can't afford to not be on all cylinders because somebody will talk, tell you too. And you need that. I think. I, I think that's one of the greatest gifts. And I think that is the proper word to use that I walked away from my time on the cross the training staff with is the is the ability to to welcome feedback because i think most human beings you know most people know that feedback will make you better that's one thing then you being able to actually listen to it is another thing because everyone says that they want feedback then the first time they get it they're like well this sucks you know i don't like getting feedback and i feel bad and why would you say those things to me and how dare you and so the, the process of 
recognizing that feedback is important and then and then truly becoming open removing your ego letting your guard down humbling yourself that doesn't happen overnight it didn't happen overnight for me that's for dark no. sure. but when i finally pulled my head out of my rectum and figured out that this was the way you know yep. if, if i could actually become the sort of person that is truly open to feedback your advancement will skyrocket and whether it's training, public speaking, I don't care what it is. So I do truly believe that's one of the biggest gifts that I walked away with. And you're right, because it would, it would come to the point where we would, you had the staff of that same culture that let's say, you know, as the flow master, you had to go do something, you get called away for some administrative, whatever, and you, you missed somebody's lecture. I mean, you get to the point where a trainer would finish a lecture, come back and be like, Hey, I just gave the, you know, the whatever lecture, what do you got for me? I'm like, ah, I had to go do this. I'm sorry, yeah. I didn't get to do it. And they were furious that, that I didn't have a critique. So yeah, that was yeah, cool yeah. when they got to the point that they were like, well, you know what? If you just didn't give me feedback, you just didn't make me better. Like, I want that feedback. And I was like, yeah. that's a cool place to see a, a group of human beings get to. Yeah, it's, just, it's pretty cool. It's, I mean, it, you can't fail to grow in that environment right but it's also it's kind of funny as well because feedback in and of itself is a skill set that requires developing too you know like just like when we try to coach folk on the dance floor the ability to look at sometimes uh, a laundry list of faults or things that we want to try and help our athlete with and we have to be like well you know maybe i'm gonna to have to ignore some other stuff to get most buy-in on one or two things it's the same with feedback you know if you just deliver top to bottom you know like these are all the ways in which i want you to try and implement how you did something next time mm -hmm. it's, they're just going to see a list of things and be like well what do i do with all of that information the same as like somebody on the dance floor it's like hey i want you to push your knees out put your hips back and make sure your chest stays up and while you're at it keep your weight on your heels they're like what so, basically like that email that i sent you sounds like that was <laughs> that was early in my career of giving feedback it was probably way too much you know i should have distilled it down to some yep. uh some key points and uh and summarized it a bit now my ego um, needed it, buddy. I was used to I was used to doing stuff. I was a young punk, and I was used to doing well. So having somebody to just go, "You ain't that good, mate." I needed that. <laughs> I think I think I think everybody needs that every now and again, bud. You know, and everybody. I don't care where you are in the food chain. Everybody's got somebody that gave them both barrels of the shotgun, right? And I'm going to tell you, somebody who gave me both barrels of the shotgun initially, and. I think he's just the type of person that he doesn't care. He'll point that shotgun at anybody. It was Todd Widman. Yeah, I had the same. Same, 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 same. <laughs> Todd yeah. does not care. He will yeah. shoot you straight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You will, yeah. You will walk was... out of the room with no illusions as to about how you did. Dude, I missed. So I was working with him, the South Africa regional, um, part of the judging team. And um, I missed the timeline um, by like five seconds, like a walk on time by five seconds, five seconds. And he comes walking over to me, stands right next to me. And um, I was like, oh, here it comes. And he looks over and he goes, Carl, a deadpan. You know, I love you like a brother, right? And I'm like, here it comes. And he was like, <laughs> that was like, don't make that happen again. I was like, okay. Unacceptable. And it, yeah, exactly. And it didn't happen again. So I did all right there. I did okay. But yeah, there's, um, it's good. It's, it's, you, you know where you stand. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. You know, when, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not sure if, if this is how it is over there in Scotland. But at the beginning of the video, I said that you and I just set a new, you know, PR or PB for actually linking up. Um, does PR and PB stand for something different in your area of the world? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, fun one. That's it. I mean, it's, it's kind of. I think if PR, if it's annotated on medical stuff over here, it means something's been administered uh, per rectum. So I think that's kind of like the funny little aside that whenever we see people go like, you know, 500 pound back squat PR, we're like, ooh, that must have stung. <laughs> I said that in some kind, I learned that for the first time somewhere over in Europe that I was lecturing and I mentioned a PR and how important PRs were and everybody should want a PR. <laughs> And everyone in the audience was giggling, and I could not for the life of me figure out why they were giggling until somebody was like, over here we say PB, personal best, and they explained what PR said. I was like, well, good to know. Somebody should have told me that before I landed in the country and said it yeah. 15 times over the course of the day. No, there's, there's plenty of examples of that, right? I think Coach Bergner fell foul of that on a seminar as well, where he's, uh, you know, the, the warm-up drill where you kick your butt, right? I think you call them fanny whackers or something like that. 
yeah, yeah, those mean entirely different things over here, right? So that, that area of the body <laughs> changes somewhat in geography. So yeah, that was an interesting one where somebody had to explain to Coach B that that doesn't mean the same thing over here. You're not getting the point across that you think you're getting across. Yeah, everybody's still in, by the way. It looks like a fun time, but it's probably not what you intend it to be. <laughs> where, where were we that we were working a seminar, and you probably know where I'm going with this, and we did Helen oh, yeah. on that track, and you and I hadn't, um, either we hadn't worked together that much or we hadn't worked out together that much because I was under some sort of illusion because Helen's one of my better workouts, but I was under some illusion that I was about to establish dominance over Mr. Stedman and it went dramatically the other way. Where were we? That was, that was in, I'm going to probably really ruin the pronunciation, but it's Chievre Air Force Base in Belgium or Chievre. Oh, or right, right, like right. And it had, a, had an outdoor running track, huh? which was why we decided to do Helen, because there's not many places have like outdoor running track right next to the yep. gym. Was Mads there as well? Mads yeah. Jacobson? Oliver was there as well. And that was actually um, Mac McLean, Marcus McLean, who's on seminar staff now. He was on yeah. that course as a, as, a, as a participant. Oh, you're kidding me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Oh, small world, man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I remember we, we walked out there got warmed up for Helen and we took off on the first run. And, you know, I consider myself just a veteran CrossFitter, you know? And so I'm like, you take off in a pace that I found to be just criminally negligent, like how fast you were running. It was obnoxious. And I was like, that's fine. This guy's, he's fired up. Um, he's going to be a first round hero. It's going to crash and burn. I'll reel him in in round two, reel him in in round three. And the pace that you took off on, you maintained for the entire workout and it you not only beat me with regards to the clock you beat my soul like i was i was crushed like it it, it, it recentered my whole like maybe i don't know so much about pacing and work i didn't know my goodness like i remember that to this day just cracked me up oh. you demolished that the 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 fun other side of that was you know i was i was feeling the pressure too so i was like like show it's a big deal but i was like i know i can run so, you know, it's like the big swinging dick contest, wasn't it? I'm like, right, here we go. I'm going to go. And the thing was as well, about a third of the way round on that first lap, I was like, in my head, I was going, mistake. I was, <laughs> I was really like absolutely having a ping it there. But then I was like, I can't take the pressure off now, otherwise I'll lose face. So it's totally stupid male pride, which made me keep pulling the pin and absolutely end myself, right? That was all it was, just pride and ego, mate. But it was good fun. I enjoyed it. It could be one of those times. things where, you know, you, you set a time that you never saw again for like five years, you know? Oh, totally. I don't think I could get near that again, ever. <laughs> you know, like that's just, that's pulled the pin. And um, are you yeah, just, I think, yeah, are you naturally fun. fast? You like to run? Did you run growing up? I mean, where did the speed come from? Yeah, to be fair, I've just always enjoyed, like, you know how you just have a natural aptitude. Some characters can just run and some can't. Like, I've always just been able to run, played sports, and just been able to sprint pretty quick. So, you know, played wing, whether it's going to be on the football field or on rugby. And, um, you know, that's just generally where the faster players take off. And, um, yeah, always been there. I had a bit of an aptitude for running. Low skill, on it, really? Just tuck your <laughs> thumbs in and go. Oh man, no, but but it's running. I'm I'm one of those bizarre crossers. I like. I'm not saying that I'm good at running, but I like running. Yeah, I, me I, too. I love it in a bizarre way. I find it. I find it actually quite enjoyable. Um, and I don't do it as frequently as I should. So, as we give this, as we we have this chat right now, we are in we're in May, I guess. What is the general status in your area of the world for COVID nineteen? Are gyms open? Are they closed? You know. What do you just, guys, what's going on? We are just sort of starting to open up again um, across, because even though um, it's the United Kingdom, all of the different sort of countries within the United Kingdom have all got their own sort of governing bodies that decide realistically what to do. So, you know, what England does isn't necessarily what, say, Northern Ireland does or Wales or Scotland. And Ireland isn't part of the UK anyway, right, for all the crazy historical reasons that sit there. So you've got... Um, yeah, they're all kind of doing different stuff. So currently, Scotland is able to run um, gyms indoors, which was, you know, kind of funny because we ha we've been able to train people outside for a while. But everyone was like, you realize that it's Scotland, right? Training people outside perhaps isn't the strongest of choices. I was going to say, every time I see you on Instagram, I don't care what month of the year it is, it looks cold. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hence the hair and the facial fuzz, right? It's uh, right. 
easy installation. But yeah, so, you know, gyms can train indoors, but it's, um, you can't run sort of specific classes. It has to be a bit more of an open gym format. It's a weird kind of loophole that everyone's got to navigate. But yeah, so basically people can train inside within socially distant squares and taking care of all of that stuff. Um, likewise in England, I think Wales just opened up yesterday, I believe, um, for being able to get back indoors. Ireland should be happening soon. Um, Northern Ireland, I believe, are, are open as well. So yeah, it's it's getting there. We're all we're all coming back into the uh, fight slowly but surely. I know this is not scientific, and I didn't ask you to like go dig out the data and be like give an actual factual reason. So I'm open to the fact <laughs> that you know this is just your gut feeling. Yeah, but as an, in a general sense, the CrossFit community, you know, affiliate owners, brick and mortar locations there in Europe. Are they on life support? Are they are they clinging and barely holding on? You know, do you think, does it seem like most are going to finally pull through if we can get some doors open? Or, I mean, how tragic has it been? Yeah, I think I think there's been losses. You know, there's been a few affiliates that have had to close. But, you know, for, sure. every, for every one of those, there has been more that have found that it's really drawn the community together. So there's been, you know... I'll give you an example. In Glasgow, there were, you know, the gyms got closed down, but two of the um, gyms got together. They stripped one of the rigs out of one of the gyms, rebuilt it in a car park, and then be able to provide a community for training for both of their gyms to come together. That wouldn't have happened, you know, like, no. unfortunately, you know what it's like. Sometimes there's an element of, in the CrossFit um, affiliate owners community, there can sometimes be a little bit like, my kung fu is better than your kung fu, and it, it, sure. it, it creates a little bit of animosity. But I've seen that it's actually been a catalyst for people getting together and helping each other too. So, you know, there's been, for every gym that's been struggling, there's been more success stories and more people coming together and some really good initiatives drawn from it as well. You know, like we've got a, a part of the solution campaign as well over here in the UK, which is awesome. That's done by a couple of CrossFitters, which was, you know, hey, if you put money towards this um, part of the solution pot, then what we'll do, you get a t-shirt out of it, but that money then gets allocated to a struggling gym. And um, Oh, nice. And so there's been there's been some really cool initiatives that have been born out of that, right? And good ideas that have come about through the community, which I think is, um, yeah, it's been super cool. So yeah, there's been struggles, but you know, I think CrossFit community and CrossFit affiliate owners, especially those that have been around since, you know, like their five plus years, they're used to having challenges, right? They're used to having mm -hmm. things that have to overcome, you know, even if it's just the challenge of trying to make the madman Castro's workouts happen in their gyms every every year, then they'll right, still right. <laughs> they'll still figure it out. So it's been so cool. somehow the challenge is just kind of it forced a lot of communities or affiliates to be creative. Probably, okay. you know, yep. totally right. and, and a lot of them probably have a home based program that they didn't have before. And now even exactly. once they come out of lockdown, they will. You know, exactly. and yep. it forced yep. people to become more um, more creative with programming minimal gear like it 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 did it did kind of force some ingenuity love it or hate it that even when covid goes away and gyms open back up those benefits will still be around and that's and that'll be a great thing you know for sure so yep. with the in person you know gyms being closed down society to some degree being closed down in person contact being closed down you know you traditionally when you travel around for work, well, first of all, you travel traditionally for work. And now you've, like you said, you've gone through the greatest extent of not traveling. But as it turns out, seminars have found a way to keep going. And so now you're doing them through your laptop. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly right. Ringing in from, from the barn out back, right? The, uh, the affiliate barn gym. So yeah, we, we've got to do, it's been a solid rudder adjust where the, uh, it's an online course now. So you can either use that to revalidate um, an existing credential that's where it began so it started off with only those that needed to revalidate an existing level one level two perhaps even level three could attend the online webinar which was cool you know one person uh, one coach to sort of eight people on the screen max which was cool drove a really intimate discussion and stuff was cool um, and then you dove into all the movement series so if you've been on the level one then we break um, the nine foundational movements down into three series there's like a squat series a press series a deadlift series and we do that um, kind of back to back across the four hours with breaks spread in. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we go through it. So pretty much that answering questions, discussing ways of implementing it, you know, two goals really of that practical element of um, first goal, eyes on their movement, give them some feedback, hopefully improve it. And then hopefully if they are interested in that, taking forward to be trainers, then we hopefully set them up with good success of strategies on how to 
teach the movements and see them a little better, et cetera, et cetera. And um, yeah, it's worked really well to the point where now it got um, released to people if they want to go through it for the first time and get that trainer credential for the first time in areas where there aren't in-person courses, then they can sign up for and get it done that way too. So yeah, it's been, it's been interesting to my commute's gone from potentially all day Friday, all day Monday to get back from a course to a stroll across the back deck in to get into the gym and come back again, which is, you know, I'm not mad at that. <laughs> How nice is that? And, and, and both parties, who's getting who? You can't replace the in-person um, experience. It has so much benefit. Like it's, it is what it is, but that online thing has benefits too. I mean, you, you sleep in your own bed, you're not driving to the airport, you're not staying in a random hotel. And then the individual who wants to attend the course doesn't have to incur those expenses either. So there is a nice, yeah, you know, had, a nice kind of back and forth there. Um, yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And you, you know, before we did this, you know, we had a little chat offline and you blew my mind because when I came off the road and left the CrossFit seminar staff, I mean, quite frankly, also because I, I was getting burnt out from the level of travel and then made my way more into the media side of the house, I was around 200 seminars. And then I asked you, I'm like, you got a ballpark idea of how many you're at? And you're like, ah, I think it's approaching 400. I was like, 400 seminars. Yeah. Wow. That's, I mean, I'm going to break out a calculator. So, you know, let's, you know, some are, like you said, you're doing some now that have eight people, but, but that's only been recently, right? Like that's only like 30 or so seminars out of your 400. You can have 50 people in an audience. So let's say, you know, the last few have been, have been less. So let's say there was on average 45 people in the audience. That means you have been in front of about 18,000 people communicating, talking, hearing their stories, what's going right, what's going wrong. That's a lot of people, all, and not just in your circle, but that's 18,000 people from all corners of the earth. I mean, that's, that's a really cool 30,000 foot view of what's going on in affiliates with programming, with training, with coaching. And so from your vast experience, you know, if you've got people watching this or listen to this, you know, in, in a couple months, what are some of the greatest hits, right? Like some of the things, the common questions, or if you could just, you know, impart some little pearls of wisdom from people that haven't traveled all around the world and had that experience, what would they be on both the, you know, maybe the affiliate side, the programming side, the coaching side, take it wherever you want to go. Cool. Yeah, that's, oh my goodness. There's some fun ones. First thing, <laughs> How I much guess, time do we have, huh? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. I guess I've got a, a, some apologies to make as well, right? If all of those thousands of folk have had to listen to me, then according to my wife, I need to apologize, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's, I think a lot of it is, is centered around like, how can, how can I be better for others? Which is, you know, like, that's what a lot of the trainers will be asking. And a lot of the questions are centered around. They kind of scratch their head about, you know, I'm presented with this situation in the gym or out on the dance floor when I'm coaching, or generally in, in the boxes, you know, how can I be better? And more of the time, it's because they're trying to do too much stuff, you know, like whether it's going to be they're trying to do too much um, teaching and underdoing any seeing and correcting as a result of it. So I'll give you an example, right? They'll be like, hey, I was going to say, somebody might be hearing this and saying, well, how can I do too much teaching? I'm supposed to teach. What do you mean? Yeah, so it would be like, you know, if, if we arm ourselves with the basic knowledge of what makes a successful air squat, then we know that we need to keep like a flat back. You know, the depth is important, the weight through the heels, how we actually move is going to be important and we keep the knees tracking. So I could stand up the front of the gym and deliver all of that information about it being the correct things to do. And that is correct information, but it's just too much because everybody's kind of looking at you nodding and it's all just going in one ear and out the other more, than not, more often just than not. Glaze yes, over. Uh-huh. So realistically, we kind of say, well, it's far better for you to, you know, maybe brief one of those things, like how to set up correctly and then hold people accountable. So, you know, for example, if I say, hey, I want you to place your heels under your shoulders, then, you know, the irony that sits there is coaching didn't really teach me this. Being married and having kids did, which is just because I say something doesn't mean it's going to get done. Right. So you've got right. to be <laughs> right. So it's going to be like, hey, OK, now I've given you something to do. Let me go and check that you do it, because if I don't, then that can shoot me in the foot later on. If I'm trying to get a successful movement, if somebody sets up too narrow, then that can lead to a lack of all of the other stuff that I want from the movement. So I've got to be able to 
make my life easier. So normally we're trying to get all of this information out that we end up vomiting it all over our athletes. And then we go, all right, now I've got to try and correct all of that stuff. So I'm going to be like, keep your weight back on your heels more, but remember to drive your knees out. Now I need you to be a little lower and your athletes just like, dude, like, mm -hmm. what do you need here? So I think a lot of it is, is taking people like you can take your time. You can just, just simply look at your team just for balance on their feet as an example you know you've got time and just spend a little bit of time going around everywhere within that you're going to see people who are up on their toes and giving you a big example sure. of it not being done but you're also hopefully if you're only looking for that weight on the feet you'll also notice those little subtle shifts <clears throat> which which are going to be helpful for your more experienced athletes so you know i think that would be one of the the bigger things we talk about which is just you know do a little less comma better you know like you because... need to just dive on in there you know because if you are if you do tell four things to an athlete by the time the fourth thing leaves your mouth they've forgotten the first thing or yep. probably the first two things yep. you you used one little word in in what you just said there there was one little word you said that i think is critically important but you just moved through it and you could dive into that as well because you said you know perhaps give somebody just one thing and then hold them accountable yeah now that's a big part right yeah, like yeah, sure. level two experience and all that. so when you what does it mean to hold an athlete accountable and how do you do that well i think the good thing is if you're if you're looking for specifics then that means that you can always give feedbacks on that specific right so for example if you're only looking for we've used it before so we might as well stick with it weight on the feet and staying on the heels predominantly then you can be like all right, I'm looking at you do it. And if you do it, I'm going to be like, hey, good job. I'm keeping those heels down, Pat. Well done. I can celebrate that success. As opposed to if you go rock forward onto your toes, I'm going to be like, hey, try and find those heels a little harder for me, Pat. Watch you do it again. That's a good job. Well done. It means that I can just always be qualifying my statements and remind myself to be um, accountable and holding myself accountable to details too. Because something that we always will catch our trainers out on is if they're looking at a movement and they don't, they don't really see anything then they'll go uh-huh okay do another one and then normally what comes out of their mouth is something like this okay good and then you straight out the gate you know I'm, i guess i can lean on a bit of experience here I, I can hear that and it's like that's my little win i'm like what was you know like and they'll be like well the movement was good and i'm like nah, uh, uh, uh. like what specifically about the movement was good and they'll be like yeah you got me i wasn't looking at anything in particular and like that's fine take ownership mm -hmm. of that little piece now choose one thing like what are the points of performance again let's have a quick reminder you know like all right it's heels it's knees it's depth right choose one of those things i ain't mad you make a choice which one of those is important to you right now now go and see if they actually do it don't worry about anything else just go see if they do it and if they do right tell, tell them good job give them an attaboy you know like whatever it needs to be just it reminds you to look for specifics and just dive that little bit deeper into movement and that's how you can kind of separate the great coaches from just the good ones i think you know, from my from my time in in media and doing stuff on camera, you know, I would get critiqued, and everybody has to get critiqued to get better, right? And everybody has their crutch words, their safe oh, wait, okay. words, those yeah. those words that they say. They don't even realize that they say them because most human beings don't like a pause in the conversation, and so they feel that they need to fill the pause by saying something. And a lot of trainers, their their go to word is just good. Yeah. You know, and they'll walk around just saying, and, and if you recorded them, they probably wouldn't even realize how often they say good, not because the movement's good or not because the people that they want to get into a shoulder with stance actually went into a shoulder with stance. It's just what they say. They're like, okay, everybody, we're going to learn the air squat. Let's go ahead and put your feet in a shoulder with stance. Okay, good. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is tighten your belly. Okay, good. And this, okay, good. Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay, good. And if you and if everything's good, well, then that word loses its value. And so you want to save that word for when it's actually good. And then your athletes will know, oh, I did accomplish whatever the objective was, you know? Yeah, yeah. oh, yeah. totally. And it's, it's all about you've got all of those pieces of the puzzle. That's exactly right. You know, so just qualifying that statement and making it less throwaway. I mean, from a lecture point of view. I think one of the funniest ones that we use all the time, which is, does that make sense? And, and I think the irony that kind of sits there is if you're having to say, does that make sense? Then that basically means you're not comfortable and confident in your own delivery. And you're trying to let the person who's, who's on the receiving end bail you out by like saying, oh yeah, yeah, that, that totally makes yep. sense. You know? And it's like, so 
if you catch yourself out by saying, you know, after you've delivered any information, you're like, does that make sense? Then probably it doesn't. So you, you, you should learn from that for next time. You know, I had to keep my credentials up. So I just attended the level two as a participant two or maybe three weeks ago. Uh, and I did it in Seattle here in Washington State. And I hadn't been through a course like that as a participant in quite some time. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I, it came to the, for the time for me to coach my small group. And I think I was doing like a push jerk or something like that. Ooh. And Michelle Moots was the flow master there. She was running me through. Solid human being. Fantastic yeah. human being. And she's going through and I'm, I'm walking through and I'm feeling good, feeling like, you know, I'm doing really well on this. But without even realizing it, I wasn't being relentless. Like I wasn't holding people as accountable as I should. I was being a little bit lazy. And what I mean by that is I was, I was correcting the low hanging fruit, you know, the start position, the finish position, you know, and then yeah. the, the, the quicker moving components that I'd have to stop take a little bit more time, dive in, um, maybe give a tactile or verbal cue, maybe do a demonstration, maybe run an active classroom. Uh, I was just bypassing those a little bit. And it's funny, so I, I made my way around the group and then Michelle's like, okay, let's stop for a second. It's like, oh no. Yeah, <laughs> okay, you like she, she walked. She walked over to me, God bless her. And she just kind of leaned in. She's like, I know that you see the faults. So like, don't walk by them, dig in. Yeah dig in like make these people work and and that will not only make them work but that will make you work as a trainer and so now both parties are going to get better and i was like ah oh, you're so right you're so right but it's so easy it's so easy to do right yeah hey, we talk about complacency being a sneaking disease like you don't in any way shape or form in any in any factor in your life you don't wake up one day complacent and not putting the same effort into something it's a drip feed it's like this horrible insidious thing that just sneaks in by just every day you're like ah that'll do ah that'll do ah that'll do and then all of a sudden it adds up you know and all of a sudden you're, you're down the line and it's like you're not paying the same attention to detail as you as you used to in anything and so that's all about it you know it's like just don't it's a, I think complacency, this was always taught to me, right? I've always got loads of sound bites, you know, like things like whenever you talk, somebody isn't moving. When do you do your work? When they're moving, which basically is a polite way of saying shut up. And you right. got things like complacency breeds mediocrity, you know, and it's like, it's, it's kind of true. You know, like if you just be accepting of a little less each time, you'll, you'll eventually end up being less good at what you're aiming to do. Mm -hmm. So if you can, if you can hold, yourself accountable which is tough if i'm honest right that's why i'm lucky because i've got a wife who'll tell me I'm, I'm i'm an idiot on a daily basis which is very handy because then that stops me from being complacent on the idiocy side right so it's um i think it's a good thing and it's also the beauty of attending one of these courses because you will have people there who won't allow you to be complacent and and yep. you'll walk out a better trainer if you're open to the experience and that's a powerful tool in, you know, we mentioned this before you and I went live. One of the things I'd love to have you talk about, because you, you seem like an expert as far as I'm concerned. I, you know, I consider an expert. Anybody who's better than me in anything is an expert. So you're an expert in this. <laughs> Negative. Because I watch your Instagram stories and, and what you post there, and it seems like you've always got your kids doing some awesome version of CrossFit, beautifully scaled and modified, and they, and they actually appear – like you didn't have to threaten them to do it. Like they're having fun. They're enjoying the experience. And, and my kids, I would love to get them to do that. My kids are heavily involved in sports. They're always playing some sports, which is why I'm totally cool with it. But I crave and I, you know, I don't want to force CrossFit on them because I think that's a great way to make them hate it. So I don't oh, do that. Oh, yeah. But I have this yearning desire secretly inside of me that one day they'll be seeing, you know, they see me work out every day. They're like, hey, could I join or how, you know, so I'm waiting for that day. It hasn't happened, but you seem to already be there. And I'm, so I'm, I'm jealous of that. What's, what is, do you have a secret that makes your kids work out? Did it happen naturally? What's the deal? Give me your knowledge. Uh, well, on, well, funnily enough, what I think what we all should learn is right. Instagram, 
lies. Don't believe what you see on Instagram, right? So, <laughs> you know, it, everything's it, true on social media. Exactly, Come right? on. Oh, it paints it paints such a pretty picture, you know, but it misses the the bargaining, the threatening, the all that kind of stuff. But you know, hey, so honestly speaking, um, our kids were the same, right? So before um, we got put into a nationwide lockdown, every single night after school, they were always going and taking part in activities. And so, you know, it was every single night down at the local academy, they were swimming, doing judo, there was football, um, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and then when the lockdown happened, they had none of that. So we decided that, you know, um, we didn't want them to just sit there and be on the devices all day long. So they were going to do PE with mum and dad. And my wife was on the, the CrossFit Kids seminar staff for a good few years as well and, as, and ran the program back in the day. So knows full well about, hey, you know, you need to make it fun. It needs to be game based. It needs to be all of this stuff. So all we started doing was um, they see us go out into the gym because we tried to keep ourselves accountable to being the first ones to do it right. Lead from the front. So we'd always go and do our training session, which was always, you know, we've been following Lynchpin for years now. And so what we then did was we then just modify it based on where the kids were at um, and do the same thing. So they would either do like the limit equipment version or a version of it. So, you know, instead of doing muscle ups, they would do perhaps a jump onto a high box and, and get over it, you know, so a little bit more task oriented rather than the muscle up itself. And so they, they kind of vibed off of that. And we, we never run the clock with them. We just make it. I like, was going to ask that if you do. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We just challenge, like challenge themselves. And I think it, it didn't take them too long before they actually started feeling the worth of that, you know, like when, the, when we went through a period where the lockdown eased, they went back to school and then they had to go back into lockdown again. And in that brief period of time, they were like, dad, like I'm running around everyone on the, on the, on the football field, you know, I've, I've, I feel strong and I'm good, you know, like, Hey, I showed that I could pick my sister up and give her a fireman's carry and stuff. And they were like, and so they so got awesome. the buy-in. Yeah, exactly. They got the buy-in because they could see the real world application, I guess, of just the, the, the little bits. And we were always, it was, it was always a smash and grab raid, right? They go in, they bounce on the trampoline for their warm up. We do a little specific stuff. And then it was like, right, here's your workout. Super simple. No more than 10 minutes max of work. You know, okay. here's your little thing. And then, all right, cool. All right, off you go. Go back to your life. You know, like there was no, it wasn't, we, try, we were just trying to make it this um, real easy thing that just kind of slipped in. So now they're back at school. So for example, tonight, my wife um, is a swim, swim coach. So she's, um, they're back in the pool for the first time in a year tonight. So she's off coaching and my daughter's in the swim team. So they're off swimming. Um, and my son was like, what are we doing for PE then, dad? Wasn't even, a, it's just, it's just now part of the routine that came about. I'm so through. jealous. Yeah, but, it's, it, but to be fair, it came about through lockdown. You know, it's like a positive thing out of a negative thing, right? So right. We, had, we had the ability to get a grip on them not having the school food, which perhaps wasn't, wasn't the best, but we didn't want to turn them into the weird kids that didn't have the school food. So right. it enabled us to kind of like help them a bit more with that. Um, you know, homeschooling is not really a, as huge a thing over here as perhaps it is in the US, but that did enable us to, really helped say like my daughter with her maths not me obviously because my math sucks <laughs> but, but my wife could, uh, could really dive in on that one and um so as a result of it she's much more confident with her maths and so yeah they it's it, in honesty uh, some days it's bargaining some days maybe it's a little threatening like you're not doing your ipad stuff until you get the pe uh, and you gotta so, earn your ipad yeah, right. And so some, some things are like that. But honestly, I think it's just because, you know, they're surrounded. It's an active area. It's a place that we live. It's not a city. You know, you're out in the middle of nowhere. So activity is fine. Like we got snowed in for weeks. And so if they needed, we, we made them had to get like, had to go down to the main road to pick up firewood and coal and stuff like that for the fire, put it in a sled. And then it's like, we just said to the kids, you get it home, you know, so they had to drag that sucker up. So it's just like, you know, it's, they realize that being active and being strong is kind of necessity. You know, you can't just oh, get away with it. That's so cool. It, it, in, in the United States of America, it would probably be labeled child abuse if you actually made your kids do a little bit of work in the morning. Uh, it probably is child abuse. Um, my daughter's just turned 11 on Sunday and my son's eight. Okay. Oh, we're really close to mine. Nine and 11. Oh, yeah, they go. Yeah. But now, when you, and, and one on the way, um, yeah, well, exactly. About Congrats, by the way. Less than two months. I have a little daughter. But uh, are, when you're looking at the workout of the day and designing how to have it be for your kids, are there some things that you flat out avoid? 
I think I just base it on, we, we try to see if the movement pattern stays or if they're struggling with it. So for ages, as an example, my son couldn't do um, sort of the standard CrossFit sit up, if you will, right? With the ab mat and the knee splayed out, he just sure. it didn't have the engagement. So we were just like, well, can you just, how would you sit yourself up anyhow? And so we went back to, I guess, kind of the traditional with almost like anchored, like he'd just put, slide his feet under some dumbbells and be able to sit up that way. So we're like, well, that's yeah. your sit up then. Or, you know, we very rarely do any barbell work. We do more dumbbells and things like that. So as an example today, the prescribed workout, right, is um, you've got five rounds. I think it was GHDs and it's uh, push press. Push press, right. Yeah, and then it was a bit of a rest. And then it's like it was uh, 50 cows on the bike, right? So I'm doing, a, I'm doing like a, the scaled version all week because I've got an ultra marathon to do at the weekend, which I got conned into, which will be fun. Oh. Wow, but so we'll have to check but, back in after that. Yeah, exactly. We'll circle back on that one. But um, but yeah, so hidden within that in all the different options, like the limited equipment option and, and stuff like that. So I had my son do um, 10 sit-ups and five dumbbell push presses. So just simply going through that five rounds for time. And then instead of doing the rest, then go, kids get bored. They don't need that kind of like prescribed rest stuff. So I said, like, as soon as you've done your five rounds, then you run it down, run, leg it down to the neighbors as fast as you can and back. And that's you done. And um, it's roughly about 400 down or 400 back. So about, you know, 800 meter turnaround. Yeah. And, he was like, and then, you know, the traditional, I'm thinking, oh, I've got an easy day. And then he's like, dad, can you run with me? I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> but luckily he's not too quick yet. I can keep up with him. So um, I was going to yeah. say you're training for an ultra anyway. You know, you can yeah. use you can use some miles. Exactly. Oh, so, yeah, it was good. So there cool. you go. That's how you do it. You just close to the movement pattern. Really, I think is the closest thing we try to do. And then we don't. We're not afraid to just cut and run. Sometimes, you know, if something's a bit too gnarly in terms of complexity or anything like that, then we just say, "What movements do you want to do today?" So let's say there's bar muscle ups, and and one of them says, "Oh, I just want to hang from the the rings and do knee raises." We're like, "Well, you know, that's close as damn it." You know, that'll do for today. So yeah, you can do that instead You're still of still moving that. your body. Exactly right. So. Yeah, more, more often than not, when we have a day where we're really struggling with stuff, we'll just go make up your own workout and, um, yeah, let's go do it. And they, you know, they get to write it on the whiteboard and I have to not get my OCD eye out, right, because the lines aren't straight and stuff. Hangover from work, I guess. And, um, oh. yeah, that works well too. So, and that get, gets more buy-in if they design their own workout. So we try and let them to do that every now and again as well. Oh, man. Well, I, I will keep you posted as to how it goes with my boys because it's the same thing. I they're tremendous little athletes and i'm like i know that you've got so much potential that we're not unlocking if you would just yeah. again if you just give me 10 minutes a day we could do some <laughs> amazing stuff but hey you know it's everything's uh everything's a work in progress man i i truly truly appreciate you taking the time out of your day to to chat with me no worries um, honor got some got some good memories we did some good stuff all around the world um, it makes me happy that the community is in excellent hands. You're capable hands over there. If if people want to follow you on Instagram or reach out about something, how can they find you? How can they get a hold of you? Well, I've, I've got a really imaginative um, tagline on Instagram, which is at Carl Stedman, right? So uh, just just the name. Can't really. I'm not that clever to figure stuff out. But um, we post up what the kids do as well on the uh, on the affiliate handle as well, which is CrossFit Ellipsis. So um, we post up the ideas on that as well. So if anybody wants to sort of jump in on those, then you're welcome. We post up what the kids do along with like their, their adaptations and maybe what they look like, that kind of good stuff. So And let people know, how do you spell ellipsis? E-double-L-I-P-S-I-S, which for, for those of you that want to know what an ellipsis is, it's the three dots you write at the end of a sentence, which is, uh, it means that the work is never done. There's more to come. Oh, what a great, now that you said that, what a great name. That's a really fantastic name. Good for you. That's cool, man. Well, thanks, brother, man. I appreciate it. Good luck with your ultra. I didn't know that you had that going on. I, I look forward to hearing about how that goes. And stay warm over there. I'll do my best, man. I'll do my best. Jumping jacks, I've heard, is the way forwards. Yeah, brother. All right, man. Well, enjoy the rest of your night. Thanks again. Thanks, no worries. Thank you, sir. Later, Carl. See you, buddy.